Uh, thank you, uh, Anna, um, and to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to present uh, at this politics session. I'm certainly an incredibly august uh, company. And what a wonderful meal we had last night, so thank you for that too. As we've heard, UK agribusiness faces a very unsettled trade environment after the UK leaves the EU on the 31st of January this year. There's been a lot of talk of cliff edges, trading on WTO rules, trade agreement rollovers, mutual recognition, and I think all that, all that terminology just fogs what's actually going to happen. So what I thought I'd do in the time available to me today is shed some light on what I think will happen next, what the risks and opportunities are for UK agri-food trade policy going forward, and how I think this might affect your business. So let's start with the transition period. What's going to happen with agri-food trade during transition? The transition starts at one minute past 11 uh, o'clock at night on the 31st of January and goes through till 11 o'clock at night, uh, UK time on the 31st of December this year. During the transition period, UK EU trade will remain unchanged. You won't see a difference in the way that you trade with the EU. However, UK trade with countries with which the EU has trade agreements, some of you may take advantage of those, the EU-Canada deal, EU-Korea, and other deals like that. Now, Liam Fox has secured agreement that um, those agreements should still take effect, and the EU certainly guaranteed that in the EU withdrawal bill. The problem is the EU can't force these second countries to um, roll over those agreements, sorry, to, to allow those agreements to extend. Um, we're, we're based on, we've got to work with the consent of those countries. So far they've agreed to that, but that might change. So keep an eye on those if you trade um, through those deals. So what about after transition? So the 31st of December onwards. So the UK is going to negotiate a trade deal uh, with the EU to avoid trading on WTO rules. Now we know at the moment that this trade deal will take the form of a free trade agreement. It's going to provide tariff-free access to goods, including agricultural products. EU and UK will set their own regulatory standards, so there will not be regulatory alignment. But the agreement does envisage that there will be regulatory cooperation to avoid unnecessary barriers to trade. So that means that customs checks might still occur, but both parties are really focusing on how technology can help um, reduce uh, the friction um, at the border. So one of the questions that's very common in the media is how long will it take? And to be honest, that depends on how contentious the issues tend to be. So it's difficult to predict. Trade negotiation, negotiators often claim that trade agreements take between two to three years uh, to negotiate. Uh, and these generally tend to be uh, ones that just focus on goods and recon mutual recognition of standards. More complex trade agreements involving more sectors and also services take longer. So the EU-Canada deal took seven years, and some deals collapse under their own weight, like the EU-US uh, transatlantic trade and investment partnership. But it's true that the UK and EU uh, enjoy frictionless trade at the moment. So they're in a completely new um, era. But every trade negotiation is hard. And what I would point out is that when Greenland left the EU, it took three, three years to negotiate on a single issue, and that was fishing. So what happens if there's no deal? This is where we hear about trading on WTO rules. So the, those of you exporting to the EU will be paying the EU's WTO tariff rates. So these, as has been widely reported, are high you will still have to meet the regulatory standards of the EU in order to export. There will, of course, be separate arrangements for Northern Ireland, which are provided for in the um, withdrawal bill. So what about if you import goods? Well, the government's made it clear during their no-deal planning 
that special tariff arrangements will be brought in place. So the UK's tariffs will be dropped to zero, apart from protection for key agricultural products like beef, lamb, pork, poultry, and some dairy products. What's not clear to me is how this emergency tariff schedule fits in with the WTO rules, and I would welcome the Secretary of State's uh, views on that. Um, to the extent that there may be issues with other countries, other WTO members, in relation to that emergency tariff schedule. So what about UK trade with non-EU countries um, going forward? Now, it's clear that the UK has reached agreement with 50 countries with which the EU has trade agreements and has agreed that those deals will roll over. So they'll apply still after the end of the transition. But key countries like Canada and Japan have yet to reach agreement, and there's a lot of countries waiting on the EU-UK deal um, before they'll enter into meaningful negotiations uh, with the UK. So a lot rests on the deal. So in the time I have left, I want to focus on the risks and opportunities for UK agri-food trade going forward. So what are the risks? Now, we've heard already from Minette Vatters and, and Clive about the um, alignment between the UK agricultural policy, domestic agricultural policy, both in England and in the devolved nations, and the international trade policy. Trade policy is not devolved, but obviously agricultural policy is. To be effective in an international trade negotiation, there needs to be clear alignment between the domestic policy and the international trade policy. It's clear that there are advantages to UK agribusiness from both an EU deal and a US deal. But the question is, how will the UK regulatory regime fit within the different regulatory regimes of both these um, both these countries. It's not an impossible um, circle to square, but it does need to be thought about. Um, certainly, the trade negotiators on the other side will be very clear on what they want to achieve and that you can see the negotiating strategies already online with the US and the EU. So the second risk is that trade negotiations involve many countries, not just the countries that are actually conducting the trade agreements. And this is because the UK is a member of the WTO and so must abide by its rules. That point is clear. So the WTO rules enable major exporters to the EU and the UK or whoever else it is that the UK is entering into agreements with to seek compensation in the form of changed tariff arrangements, possibly quotas, if they feel that new trade deals compromise their existing um, trade flows. And the, we can already see some evidence of this happening as the EU and UK try to negotiate separation. So it's already happening in the WTO, particularly countries like Russia and Brazil and the US. The third risk is that trade regulation doesn't stop at the border. WTO rules affect domestic policies. One of the landmark um, policies going forward um, that DEFRA has announced is this idea of changing the EU payments to farmers for public money, for public goods. And there's a lot to be said for supporting um, sustainable agricultural food production, as I'm sure many in the audience uh, will agree. But these payments, public money for public goods, must still comply with WTO ru rules, particularly the WTO agreement on agriculture. And if there are any trade nerds in the audience, what that means is just because a farm payment is given for environmental purposes does not automatically mean that is compatible with the so-called green box. The fourth risk is trading on WTO rules is not a panacea. It is an option at the moment, but the WTO is undergoing headwinds of its own. Its dispute settlement appeals process remains stymied by President Trump's opposition to the reappointment of new appellate body members, and the WTO is currently um, witnessing a trade war between the US and China, and President Trump's response to the effects on US farmers by that trade deal is to give them payments, and the, and the legality of those payments under WTO rules is questionable. So what about the opportunities to end on a very positive note? Despite what I've just said about the WTO, 
the, U the UK is not going to head off into the trade equivalent of the Wild West, where anything goes unless the UK negotiates meaningful trade agreements. WTO rules govern maximum tariffs that countries can charge on their food, feed and drink. WTO rules also require non-discrimination between countries and between domestic and imported goods. There is no role for penalising countries um, other than um, in the way that we, we hear uh, reported in the press. So the second opportunity that I see is WTO rules do not stop countries adopting policies designed to protect the natural environment that guarantee animal welfare, good quality, healthy food, and strong food safety standards. WTO rules affect the way that these policies are implemented. So if you craft these policies appropriately within the WTO rules, there will not be any problem with that. And certainly we can see a trend towards recognizing the importance of environmental standards um, as a reason not to allow the imports of products. So the third opportunity I see is that trade agreements do not only eliminate tariffs, they can be part of a climate-friendly, healthy food solution. It's possible to embed domestic priorities like the shift to ecological, sustainable agricultural production methods into those agreements. It's possible to embed higher animal welfare standards going beyond those that would um, be, you'd see under the WTO. It's possible to embed net carbon emission targets and other domestic priorities into the UK trade deals. And if you look for an example, you can look at the EU-Canada trade deal that has uh, specific rules on trade and sustainable development. The issue, of course, is that both parties have to agree to this ambitious agenda and such an agreement will take time. So in conclusion, I think the UK has real opportunities to be a thought leader in trade and trade agreements in the field of agri-food and I, uh, in a way that supports agri-food business and protects the climate um, and going forward. We can really see the opportunity to allow the production of high quality, healthy food for healthy people and a healthy planet in our trade policy. Thank you.